Lord's Day 45, on page 134 of the Green Creed's book in front of you. <coughs> Lord's Day 45. Why is prayer necessary for Christians? Because it is the chief part of thankfulness which God requires of us, and also because God will give His grace and Holy Spirit to those only who with sincere desires continually ask them of Him and are thankful for them. What are the requisites of that prayer which is acceptable to God and which He will hear? First, that we from the heart pray to the one true God only who hath manifested Himself in His Word for all things He hath commanded us to ask of Him. Secondly, that we rightly and thoroughly know our need and misery, that so we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of his divine majesty. Thirdly, that we be fully persuaded that he, notwithstanding that we are unworthy of it, will, for the sake of Christ our Lord, certainly hear our prayer, as he has promised us in his word. What hath God commanded us to ask of him? All things necessary for soul and body, which Christ our Lord has comprised in that prayer he himself has taught us. What are the words of that prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, King Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings 8 was uttered on one of the most auspicious occasions in the history of the Old Testament church. In the dedication of the temple. The grand temple on Mount Zion, or Moriah, was completed. With great solemnity, the Ark of the Covenant was brought up and placed in the Holy of Holies. A host of sacrifices were offered, so many that they couldn't be numbered. And the elders and the heads and the chiefs of the tribes were assembled and God came down in his glory and filled the temple with a thick cloud and the people fell before Jehovah and worshipped. Appropriately, Solomon held the temple's dedication on one of the three great pilgrimage feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles. At that time, <coughs> when Israel was in the wilderness, they dwelt in tents. And then, with this Feast of Tabernacles, people were to dwell in booths made of hewn branches, temporary structures. having a dedication at this time, Solomon was saying, now God, symbolically, is going to dwell in a permanent abode, not a tent, not a booth made of branches, but a glorious temple. And so great was the celebration of the tabernacles and the dedication act, or the dedication of the temple, that the feast on this occasion ran for two weeks, not the normal one week. And at the end we read 1 Kings 8, verse 66, that all went home joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant and for Israel his people. Now one would expect a prayer made on this auspicious occasion and requirement.
important for our instruction in the scripture to exemplify what Lord's Day 45 calls prayer, which is, quote, acceptable to God and which he will hear. King Solomon's dedicatory prayer, though, is remarkable even in its own right. This is, in fact, the longest prayer recorded in the Bible. The only possible exception, I would call it an exception to this statement, is Psalm 119, but it isn't a prayer as such. It's a song which includes prayers, but this is the longest prayer. It's longer than Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9, or Ezra's prayer in Ezra chapter 9. It's much longer than the prayer that Christ taught us as disciples, the Lord's Prayer as Paul, and much longer too than Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17. This is the Bible's longest prayer. We didn't even read all of it. This prayer too is very striking, if you will forgive the way I'm expressing it, in that it is an intensely biblical prayer. Now of course it's biblical, it's in the Bible. But what I mean by this is that it very obviously contains words and ideas from earlier biblical revelation. You could say that Solomon here, in this prayer, is praying the Pentateuch, particularly Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and 30, dealing with God's covenant curses, the things he threatens and promises to bring upon Israel if they fall into idolatry. Not only is he praying the Pentateuch, so to speak, he is pleading the Davidic covenant. And we looked at that last week from Psalm 132. God has made this covenant with David, established in all things and sure. It involves a son to sit on David's throne and a succession of kings in Jerusalem and other things. And so he starts his prayer by reminding God of this and says in effect, Verify and fulfill the word that has promised in the covenant with David. This is, after all, the first requisite of prayer as explained in answer 117. We must pray to the one God only who has manifested himself in his word for all things he hath commanded us to ask of him. You may have noticed too that 1 Kings chapter 8, like Psalm 20, which we signed a few moments ago, is a prayer for the prayers of God's people. It doesn't just pray for the saints, it prays for the prayers of the saints. For instance, if you look at verse uh, 30, it says there, O Lord, hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel when they shall pray toward this place and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and when thou hearest forgive. Hearken, Lord, to the prayers of Israel when they pray to you and answer them. And it's striking that verse 30 and other parts of this psalm essentially say that the answer to God's prayer centrally is the forgiveness of sins. If you have that, you have the heart of all answered prayer. You will know too that Solomon is not a priest, because you would associate praying in the temple with priests. He's not a priest though. <coughs> He is a king. And here we have this Old Testament king, and he's praying for the prayers of God's people for generations and centuries to come. 
at any time in the future, Lord, if Israel sins and you chastise them by bringing them famine or war or pestilence or bring them into captivity, hear their prayers when they pray truly from the heart towards this place. Forgive and restore them. And that, of course, is what happened through Israel's succeeding centuries. And Solomon here, as a king, the wisest man in all the earth, dedicating this temple, praying here, is a picture of Jesus Christ and of his intercession for us. The Lord Jesus prays for us. He said, I pray not for the world, but I pray for them whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. And the Lord Jesus prays for us and for our prayers, that God will hear our prayers. Our prayers, as it were, go to him, and through his prayers, as the mediator, they ascend to the triune God. Jesus intercedes for us, not only as a priest, but also as a king, because our intercessor is even at the right hand of God, on the throne, to make intercession for us, as Romans 8 puts it. And his intercession embraces the saints and all the prayers of the saints in all ages. Like Solomon too, only far greater, the Lord Jesus' intercession for the prayers of his people includes Gentile sheep. You see it here. I hope you were struck by it in the public reading of the word. 1 Kings 8, 41 through 43, Solomon says, Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, from a far country, and he hears the truth about thy religion, and when he prays, listen to his prayer too, because he's been drafted in to the people of God. And this, the intercession of Christ, confidence in this, is the third requisite of true prayer. <coughs> Answer 117 says that we must be fully persuaded that notwithstanding we are unworthy of it, God will, for the sake of Christ our Lord, our intercessor, certainly hear our prayer as he has promised us in his word. And we need to believe in the intercession of Jesus Christ or else, or else we'll not bother praying at all. And you will remember too from the book of Revelation that Christ not only <coughs> prays for our prayers, but through his prayers, our prayers become powerful so that all the wrath which God pours forth upon wicked comes an answer to our prayers. Our prayers ascend into heaven and then they become, as it were, the vials that pour forth upon the wicked. And of course the Lord Jesus prays for us too, as well as our prayers. This dedicatory prayer of Solomon's is striking too in that it makes prayer, from this perspective of this passage, the premier activity of the temple. Now if you think of the temple in the Old Testament and some of the activities that went on there, you may recall, for instance we had a series on Jewash a few years ago, that kings were enthroned <coughs> at the temple. That the covenant was renewed at the temple. The people went on pilgrimage to the temple, as we've seen the last few months. People offered money at the temple. On occasions, there were great chests where coins were dropped in. The Levites offered praise and song at the temple, as we heard this morning. The priests sent up sweet-smelling savours with their sacrifices 
at the temple. There were prophets such as Jeremiah who frequently would go to the temple to preach. There were a lot of people there. There were people thinking about religious things. He had an audience. Isaiah had a vision involving the temple that constituted his call in Isaiah chapter 6. But here Solomon, in the dedication of this temple, does not pray for the praises of Israel or their sacrifices or the sermons at the temple. He prays for the prayers made at the temple and towards the temple. You may know too, beloved, that in Isaiah 56, God's temple is called a house of prayer. It's called a house of prayer for all people, including the Gentiles. Think again of 1 Kings 8, 41 through 43. The temple is not called a house of praise by Isaiah, though it was that, or a house of preaching, though certainly there was a lot of preaching down there, or even a house of sacrifice, he highlights this, that it was a house of prayer. And so in the years after Solomon's utterance of this dedicatory prayer, we read, for instance, of Hezekiah taking the mocking letter of Rabshakeh, going up into the temple, spreading it out before the Lord and saying, Lord, you've seen how the enemy ridicules us. Hear from heaven, Lord. Destroy them. This is a very low and sad day. We need thy help. You will remember too, Daniel, in the Babylonian captivity, when prayer was forbidden for a month, it must only be offered to the emperor, Daniel swings open his window and prays towards Jerusalem three times a day, as was <coughs> his custom. Daniel 6. And even Jonah, Jonah in the belly of the wheel prayed towards God's temple. You say, how in the wide world did he know what way to point himself? Well, <coughs> an earthly temple, of course, where God dwelt, symbolized God's dwelling in heaven. It was a representation of it on earth. And Solomon himself, in 1 Kings 8, understood this fine well and states it. So because of this occasion then, of Solomon's dedicatory prayer and the <coughs> excellency of the prayer itself, one would expect assistance in learning the characteristics of that acceptable prayer which God will hear, to quote question and answer 117. We've already looked and mentioned the first and third reasons we must pray to God according to his revelation, of course. Do as God says. And we must pray in confidence knowing that we have an intercessor who is God and man at God's right hand. The third reason. Now we need to concentrate and we will focus on the second requisite of true prayer. Secondly, says answer 117, for prayer to be acceptable to God, we must, quote, rightly and thoroughly know our need and misery, that so we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of his divine majesty. <coughs> That's what Solomon's getting at in 1 Kings 8, verse 38. When he says that God hears the prayer of every man who knows what he calls the plague of his own heart. Let's consider in our remaining time the plague of the heart. First, the meaning, and second, the lessons. The meaning and the lessons of the plague. Follow with me, using your eye on the page, the various <coughs> prayers that Solomon makes regarding the prayers of God's people in distress. In verses 31 and 32, 
Solomon prays that God would hear and judge his people's illness. So if there is a disagreement between two Israelites or more, that God would judge the one who breaks his oath and vindicate the one who is true. In verses 33 and following then, we get to the heart of it. Solomon prays that God would hear and answer his people's prayers. And then we have various specific prayers. If Israel suffers a military defeat, verses 33 and 34, answer the prayers and grant deliverance. If the people of God suffer drought, verses 35 and 36, if they experience famine and other things, 37 through 40, if they humble themselves and pray, grant relief. If the Gentile convert mentioned earlier, which is 41 through 43, prays, hear his petitions too. If Israel is going out to battle, verses 45, 4 and 45, and they utter a petition, hear them Lord. If Israel is taken into captivity and they humble themselves and cry out for help, <laughs> deliver them. Verses 46 and following. In other words, these various scenarios of misery and affliction cover all the difficulties pretty much that Israel will experience in the years to come. In the way of prayer, God will preserve and save his people in this world. That's the prayer itself generally. Now with this overview, we need to focus on one specific section, verses 37 through 40. In verse 37, you will see, contains some nine different woes. Famine. Then, pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, caterpillar. Then, besieged by an enemy, and plague, and sickness. Nine things. Now, it could be, and someone could argue this too, that these are simply nine variegated judgments, with no particular connection between them. Or it could be that there is indeed a relation between these nine woes. And I think the latter, and I'm going to argue for it, I want you to see what you think. First of all, we have famine. Famine, as you know, is a dire shortage of food, so that you're starving. Then we have pestilence, blasting, or blight, and mildew, and these are crop diseases which lead to a shortage of food, if they're extreme, that is famine. Then we have locusts and caterpillars, which are insects which eat the crops, and if they eat enough of the crops, that leads to famine. Then we have a reference to Israel being besieged. And the purpose of besieging someone is amongst others, that food can't reach the people so entrapped, and they will starve. Famine. And then we have plagues and sicknesses which inevitably follow severe shortages of food. When the body becomes weak, you have little resistance, and most of the people in that position die of the diseases which ravage them run through the starving community. So what have we got here? We have crop diseases, pestilence, blight, mildew, or devouring insects like <coughs> caterpillars or locusts, or enemy sieges, all of which lead to famine, the heart of it all, which in turn leads to all manner of plagues and sicknesses. And in verse 37, the middle stage to which some things lead and from which other things follow, the middle stage famine, it's put first then it's followed by the six causes of famines and three different types 
crop disease, devouring incense, insects, enemy sieges, ending with two results of famine, plague, <coughs> sickness. Now of these three, famine, the causes of famine and the results of famine, the results of famine are the worst and they carry people away, sickness and plague. The others lead up to and cause <coughs> sickness and plague. But it's the sickness and the plague, which is an even worse form of sickness, that kill by far the greatest number of people. And plague is the key idea. Now in this judgment, therefore, of plague and all the evils leading up to it, the people of God then begin to supplicate his throne. They're driven to it. They're in dire straits. But the question then is, whose prayers is God going to hear? Well, he hears the prayers of his elect, regenerate people, not the reprobate. He prays the elect to be more precise. He, he hears the prayers of the elect to be more precise and to take the turn of the text itself, verse 38. He hears the prayers of the elect who knows not just the plague which is ravaging the community and killing people left, right and centre, but he hears the prayer of the man who knows the plague of his own heart. That's what verse 38 says. In the midst of this plague, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all the people of Israel, which shall know every man that plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands towards this house, the temple, then hear him and answer his prayer. That reference, of course, to praying towards God's house does not mean that you have to work out where you live in relation to this building. <coughs> like a Muslim pointing his nose towards Mecca, get the angle. You know, praying towards the temple, an Old Testament typology, doesn't mean that we pray towards some particular church building. It means that we pray to Jesus Christ, who is the temple. Destroy this temple, he said in John 2, and in three days I will raise it up. And he spoke not of the temple in Aaron's day, but of his temple, the body. We pray to and through Jesus Christ, our intercessor. He's the temple because God dwells in him. Infinitely higher way than he dwelt in any building of brick and mortar in the Old Testament. So we have that second element then of Lord's Day 45, Passion Answer 17. The second element of an acceptable prayer that we rightly and thoroughly, thoroughly know our need and misery so that we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of God's majesty. And we do that as we're aware of the plague of the heart which God brings home to sinning Israel by the outward judgment of plague, which ravages the people as the culmination of all the judgments of 1 Kings 8, 37. What then is meant by knowing the plague of the heart? Well, the parallel passage 2 Chronicles 6, verse 29. And it's useful to look at parallel passages. It's a very helpful method of ascertaining the mind of God. The parallel passage renders it every man's knowing, quote, his own sore and his own grief. So that personally, the man who prays is afflicted with the affliction. <coughs> that he knows it as the chastisement of God which comes on account of his sin and the sin of 
Israel. And this fits with the simple, obvious explanation of 1 Kings 8, 38. The plague of the heart is our own sin, which brings God's chastisement. And the point of the text is that those, and those only, who know their sin as a terrible plague, they're the ones God hears in Jesus Christ. <coughs> it is God only hears the prayers of those who know the sinful plague of their own hearts. And as one sweep that demolishes much that is taught erroneously about Christian prayer. But you need to understand too why it is that we need to know our own sin, the plague of our heart, in order to pray truly, in order to receive answers from God. Well, the first and most obvious thing is that prayer, knowing the plague of your own heart, shows you are a Christian. Verse 38 says that this prayer is made by the people of Israel, those who are Israelites indeed. Those who don't pray, understanding the plague of their own heart, are unregenerate heathen. And scripture teaches that the prayer of the wicked is an abomination. That is, if you don't know your own sins as abominable, God says your prayer is abominable. He doesn't listen to abominable prayers. You understand too that the prayer that is heard by God comes from a heart aware of its own plea because such a heart is a believing heart. Such a heart believes the principal thing that the Bible says about man, that man is totally depraved. Imagine coming to God and saying, Lord, I'm offering to you a prayer of faith, and I know that a prayer must be born out of faith, but I think I'm good. <clears throat> God would say, well, you don't even believe what I say about you, that you're filthy and polluted in your sins. You're calling me a liar, and you say you believe, but if you don't believe that about yourself, how can you believe the truth about me? You will understand, too, that it's only the person who prays, aware of the plague of his own heart, who has any need, and sense of that need, of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know that your heart is ravaged with an evil plague, the cross of Jesus Christ is incomprehensible to you. You don't know the need for the forgiveness of sins. If you don't know the plague of your heart, you will think that you are able to go directly to God in prayer and worship. Whereas you can't. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That refers to, to our prayers and worship. But it's the person who understands the plague of his heart then, who receives grace and the Holy Spirit enabling him Pray through Jesus Christ and on the basis of his cross. <coughs> we know too that this prayer in 1 Kings chapter 8. This is a prayer which is directed to the Old Testament temple. And the most important room in the Old Testament temple was the Holy of Holies, which contained the most important item of furniture in the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the two tables of the law. But in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that symbolism means that we pray and approach a holy God who sets standards and laws for us, which if we break, constitutes us as sinners. So you can't pray towards the holy God symbolized in 
in his temple with the broken law and not know, not know the plea of your own heart. And I say advisedly the plea of your own heart because it says in the passage, every man must know the plague of his own heart. And if you don't know the plague of your own heart, you will come into the temple like the Pharisee in Christ's parable and say, Lord, I thank thee that I am not like other men, that I'm not like that poor wretched tax collector over there and all these people who do all these terrible things. And he went home not justified, but condemned. You understand as well that a prayer made by one who is aware of the plague of his own heart is a humble prayer from an abased person. And it's only those who are lowly because of the knowledge of their sins, who are clothed with sackcloth and ashes, to use Old Testament imagery, who can ever be lifted up into God's holy presence. This was the point made by Isaiah the prophet, chapter 57, 15. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, way up there. And then it adds, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. God dwells in eternity. God dwells in the left lofty and high and holy place. And he takes with him the person who is contrite and humble to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The faithful believer experiences this plague of the heart painfully. That's the only way you can experience a plague. He experiences this when he says, I'm unworthy to pray and come into God's presence. I don't deserve that. My prayers are sinful too. I don't ask her right. I don't <coughs> ask with a proper sense of my sin and need. When I'm praying, I'm wandering thoughts. You've probably experienced that during congregational prayer and during this sermon too. Because... We're wicked. We're fallen. And when I'm praying, I even have wicked thoughts. And this is what Jesus said. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, blasphemy pride, and foolishness. Mark 7. And those Thoughts, evil thoughts from within, don't just mysteriously stop whenever you call upon God's name in prayer. And so the believer says, experiencing this plague inside him, when I pray too, my heart is often cold and lazy and indifferent. That's a plague. I pray against the sin, and even when I'm praying against it, I'm delighting in it, in part of me. I pray for the forgiveness of sins and say that I believe it. But all the while, part of me doubts. Does God love me? Did Jesus really die for me? Does it even make sense? And does God hear me? And so the believer experiences, and experiences this especially, probably, when he prays, the plague of his heart, deep-seated loathsome disease, a vile leprosy within, a deadly evil. And the encouragement of this is that God will not disregard our prayers, that we have a Redeemer and an intercessor in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. We have the Holy Spirit in our hearts and we have a promise, the promise of God. Here stated, what prayer and supplication swear will be made by any man, or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hands toward this house, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive and do. 
So it's actually the feeling and the knowledge of our unworthiness because of our sin that is a qualification to prayer and a guarantee that we will be heard. And if you say, well, I don't feel this plague as I ought, the answer of course is true. Whoever feels anything or does anything as they ought, but you do feel it, you do. And you actually feel it more and more as you grow in grace to the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, you do. And for us, as well as the saints in the Old Testament, God uses hardships and chastisements like these Old Testament plagues to show us in all sorts of different ways the plague within, the ultimate misery, the greatest grief. And in so doing, God not only teaches us the knowledge of ourselves, which is the first part of saving knowledge, as our Heidelberg Catechism explains, knowing our sin and misery, but in so doing, he also teaches us to pray. Because you can't pray without that. And then God answers our petitions blesses us and prospers us on our way as we come to him through Jesus Christ.